DSLR. <laughs> Very much so. Okay. Um, Yeshua uh, speaks to his inner circle of disciples about the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, as the way it's translated. It's the Ratzim. Uh, now we're into uh, Kabbalistic language. Um, and there's a lot of background I want to give you before. I'm going to give you the, actually the big Kabbalistic download tomorrow about some things. But the mysteries are those that the Jewish mystics uh, developed, the Kabbalistic mystics, uh, in their ways of communing with heaven and ascending to the throne of God, etc. And the paradise, or the Garden of Eden, as it was called in, in the scriptures, uh, it's known as the Pardes, and it's the it's the the place it's the place in the third heaven. We're gonna have to talk about the heavens and the geography of the heavens and things like that, where one ascends in deep mystical uh, communion with Godhead, and it's a it's a Merkaba ascent, and uh, the gate into the Pardes of any Jewish Kabbalistic teacher. His way of doing things, his way of teaching is called his gate. So they would ask things like, well, what was the gate of the Master Jesus? Well, that was the lasso and these kinds of things. And the, the, the Pardes is the, uh, the high mystical place where one has communion with God and is taught by God and so on. So this brings up a lot of topics which we're going to uh, go through here. First, we have to start out with the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. In the King James, is the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to talk about a brief, a brief history of the Holy Ghost here. Um, in the 9th century to about the 5th century before the Christian era, this was known as the Spirit of God. And it could be the Spirit of the Elohim or the Spirit of Adonai, the Spirit of Yahweh. Uh, there were no angels at that time. People weren't talking about angels, and that, that was not a that was not really a theme. And there was no Satan, but just spirit, ruach, and that's what is talked about by the prophets and people at that time. And the word spirit is a feminine, it ends with a cha, and so it's feminine, and it was considered in a feminine way. Uh, the spirit of God could possess a prophet and speak through him, or he may be carried by her to the heavenly Merkaba or chariot throne of God. God was like a, in ancient time, God was a warrior God, Yahweh was. And so therefore, uh, it, he would be on a chariot, like a, the, the head of a host of uh, people in a battle, and his throne would be built <coughs> into the chariot, and that was called the Merkaba, the chariot throne. But later on it meant that he was a mobile God. He could be anywhere. He could, God was everywhere and anywhere. So therefore, his throne was not just up in one place. It was, he could be on his throne anywhere. Uh, and uh, so uh, a prophet could be carried by the Spirit to the Merkaba or chariot throne of God to be given a message to carry to Israel. Uh, and there were communities of prophets that lived in the desert. And they sang and danced ec ecstatically. And they were like shamans. They were very uh, important things. Some, some of the prophets at the time of Amos in the 8th century uh, were actual individual people who were married. Others were not. They were unmarried men and they lived in communities, separated communities. And they were, uh, they, they were involved in shamanic and ecstatic rites in which they would uh, get into ecstasies and so on and a lot of dancing. Dave, King David was numbered, some people would say, is he among the prophets? Because he would go out and dance and do music and things like that and get ecstatic and all that sort of thing. All this was the spirit. Now, there was an idea of what was called the day of the Lord. Now, notice how I put L-O-R-D as all caps. In the King James Version, if the word is Yahweh, the tetragrammaton, Y-H-V-H, -H, the unpronounceable name of God, then it's in translated in the King James with all caps, L-O-R-D. If the word is Adonai, which means the Lord of the universe, which is another word for God, then it's just Lord with just a capital L. So you'll know that if you ever see them that way. That's how they translated it. And Amos and Joel and Isaiah and so on, and the whole Isaiah cycle of the prophets and everything, refer to this concept of the day of the Lord. 
It's, it, it's sort of the antecedent to the idea of Judgment Day. And uh, the Day of the Lord was a day when a day of reckoning, when things were going to be set right and set straight again. And it was thought of by the priesthood in, in Israel as a time when Israel would be justified and would be made the, the head of all nations and everything. But the prophet, like Amos, uh, came to them and said, well, the day of the Lord will not be a day of happiness and joy for you. It will be a day of reckoning because God is unhappy with what you're doing. And the prophets came in and said, you know, you did all these bad things. So there were, um, in the prophetic schools, which are the ones who preserved the writings of the prophets, there were their disciples and their disciples' disciples, uh, inspiration that came to the prophets and to their, their lineage was by the Ruach of God, uh, and often it happened pseudepigraphically. That means that maybe it was the disciple of, of Isaiah, or a disciple of the disciple of Isaiah, who's trained in the school of Isaiah, who would write more things in the name of Isaiah. That's why we have a Deutero-Isaiah and a Trito-Isaiah. The original Isaiah is a prophet who, whose school was started before the exile, but the second part of Isaiah, which is the almost the middle half of the whole Isaiah book we have today, and Trito Isaiah, which is the last part of it, was all written hundreds of years later, or preserved hundreds of years later in Babylon, in the school of Isaiah. So you have to understand the reason we even have these guys' writings is the prophets didn't sit down and write these books. Their students wrote the books, or their successors wrote the books, or they took down what the prophets did. The prophets, uh, very few of them actually wrote anything. And there were prophetic schools, and the schools are considered to be inspired by the same Ruach that inspired the prophet, and therefore you could write in the name of the prophet. So you could say, Isaiah is saying, and that, even down to the time of Yeshua, you, there was a whole Solomonic cycle of literature, the Odes of Solomon, and then the Solomonic magic, and all this kind of stuff, and the, and the Psalms of David were not written by David, they were written by people who were after that period of time, but they were in the school of David, or or felt they were inspired by the spirit of David and so on. The, even the, uh, after Paul wrote his basic corpus of epistles and then disappears from history, later generations write in Paul's name, even though they're not Paul, because they're from, they're, they're uh, devotees of Paul and they've trained in Paul's school. And so that's where we get some of the so-called pastoral epistles or Pauline epistles. How do you feel about writings from the school of Lewis? Pardon? <laughs> what, what? I was asking how you felt about writings from the school of Lewis. The like school we started, of Lewis? Yeah, we started writing here. Um, well, I don't know how that all goes, <laughs> uh, but uh, let's move on. <laughs> so, in the day of the Lord was a future time in which God would intervene in human history to restore Israel and return justice to the earth. And that was called the day of Yahweh. Um, and this was something that all these prophets did talk about, and this is the first kind of apocalyptic that we had. Um, for example, a prophet Joel, who was probably in the 8th to 9th century BC, but some scholars argue was in the 5th to 3rd century, but they don't have very good arguments. Uh, they do it for other reasons. Prophet Joel said, uh, uh, said certain things that we're going to look at. Uh, there's a problem. The Hebrew Aramaic language does not have a past, present, future tense like we have. You can't say, oh, this is, is going to happen in the future, this is going to happen in the past, this is going to happen in the present. It just has what's called a perfect tense and an imperfect tense. A perfect tense is something that is a completed <coughs> action, an imperfect tense is something that is not yet completed. It could be something that happened in the past that's not over yet, something that could happen in the future. But the, but the perfect tense could be something that happened in the past. Daniel's apocalyptic <coughs> visions, for example, uh, recap the empires that lived from, that existed from the 6th to the 2nd century. You can trace all of his visions of the beasts, to the Macedonians, the Persians, and so on, and foresee the coming of the Baranash. And that is all written in an imperfect, and so that it could have been if it were written by the historical Daniel in the 6th century, he could be looking ahead and seeing the future. Or it could be looking back by the 
the Daniel that, or whoever wrote it in the school of Daniel in the second century, and you couldn't tell whether it was written in the future or the present or the past. And this is a problem because uh, uh, when prophecies prophesy, very often they're talking about the past when they're talking about the future in Hebrew. This is a problem with tenses about understanding. So the day of the Lord in Joel's prophecy is a prophecy of the future. It's imperfect. And Joel says, and it shall come to pass afterwards. And that's a translation because it's all just one word in Hebrew. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Yea, even upon the men servants and the maid servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And those days are the days, uh, the, the days of the Lord, the day of the Lord that will come. And this is the basis for the idea of the coming of the Mount Kuth upon earth. So, at the very beginning, the coming of the Mount Kuth upon earth was associated with spirit. Now, that's very important for early Christianity. <clears throat> In the early Christians interpreted that as to talk about the Messianic Age. So, they refer to that as the Holy Spirit age, where the Holy Spirit would be poured out upon people and people would be possessed by the Holy Spirit and they would speak in tongues and they would do all these other things. By the way, speaking in tongues in the book of Acts does not mean babbling, it means speaking in another language because there were a whole lot of people in Jerusalem and so the gospel was being preached in 10 or 11 languages by people who didn't natively speak those and all of a sudden found themselves having the capability to speak in the languages of people coming. So true uh, speaking in tongues, quote, biblical speaking in tongues, is actually speaking in, a, in another language you don't know. But modern speaking in tongues in churches is a preliterate babbling that is, that, is, uh, that is stimulated in the cerebral cortex that we find in a lot of shamanic religions and things like that. We call it the language of angels or something like that. <coughs> the idea was that in early Christianity, people would go into trances and ecstatic states and some People would actually say things that you could understand, but most people wouldn't, or some would say them in another language. Or there would be those who would interpret what people were babbling. And the interpreters would say, well, this person says this, this person says that, the Holy Spirit tells us this. And so these uh, spirit possession and utterances by church prophets and church prophetesses in a trance were an awful lot about how church... Uh, the whole deposit of church tradition started to develop after Yeshua was gone. Here's a, a, a picture I put in of all these people, you know, being inspired by the Spirit and all this sort of thing. But that was because in the, on the day of the Lord, in the prophecy of the future, the Spirit of God would be poured out upon all kinds of people. That's the idea. So... Now we have to understand that spirit is feminine. And we have to talk about Mrs. God here. In the pre-exilic period, about the 12th to the 6th century, before the Babylonian exile, um, there were Semitic deities. And um, El Elyon means God Most High, the highest God. Uh, and Asherah was his consort. Uh, this was Canaanite deity, Ugaritic, and Hebrew deities. And uh, the, uh, the name, what we have in the book of uh, Genesis, which is written not until the 6th century <coughs> BC by the priest, they talk about the Elohim, which is the plural for God, but we talk about it as though it's a singular, meaning the one God, but it actually is a plural term. And we can talk about the spirit of the Elohim, plural, earlier, or we can talk about the spirit of God as Elohim, the gods, later. But the Hebrews were henotheistic. That means they were not monotheistic like classic Greek philosophers became uh, during that period of time, like Parmenides and other people that came up with the idea of monotheism and so on. But they were henotheistic. <clears throat> Their god, Yahweh, was the El Elyon, the highest god. But these other gods did exist. And as part of that uh, Near Eastern uh, kind of culture and uh, um, so on and the customs, uh, the, most of the male deities would always have female consorts <coughs> or queens. Um, now Asherah 
was the creatrix of human life. She was the female creator, the mother of the world. She was associated with the planet Venus. And she was very often portrayed as a winged creatrix, uh, worshipped as the Ugaritic Kodesh, meaning holy, holiness. And she was related to the Babylonian Ashtarte and Ishtar and the Greek Aphrodite. They were all aspects of the same kind of energy. Uh, she was a goddess of love and of animal husbandry. Remember, men used to go chasing animals and herds all around all year long, so they never lived in one place. They had to chase the herds and, and, and hunt them down. Women learned how to breed animals, and therefore you wouldn't have to move. You could just breed them <laughs> and have them as domestic animals. And women, women were the ones who discovered agriculture. They were the ones who discovered what caused plants to grow, that seeds could be planted, etc. So women are responsible for selling men down. And uh, the goddess of these things were the goddesses who discovered things like grain and stuff like, like, like Demeter, the goddess of grain, the Eleusinian mysteries, etc. So this creatrix, this female creator, was the goddess of love and animal husbandry and seeds and herbs and fertility. And so you'll always see her with animals and plants and like large breasts and various kinds of things like that. Uh, now, the patriarchal male prophets of the prophetic wilderness communities in, in, in Israel, uh, where they were separated Hasidic guilds, and this, these were the male mysteries of Israel, they campaigned against the Asherah tree shrines that were all, all over Israel, all over Canaan, all over Israel, all over the Middle East. And they appeared, there was always an Asherah shrine right next to a Yahweh shrine all the time, and people worshipped them together. Asherah was, uh, she was immediately accessible, she was, uh, she was imminent, she was contactable. Yahweh was transcendent, he was far off. And uh, so she was what was really called upon for, to get something done. If you wanted something done, you called upon yes. Asherah. Um, now, the, when, at the time of Elijah, about the 7th, 8th century BC, uh, Elijah was one of these desert uh, male patriarchal sort of dudes that wanted to go back to the shamanic religion of the Hebrews of Moses, uh, that kind of form of religion, which is based on laws and based on not living in really so much in houses but in tents and things like that. And, and he was... Uh, he believed that the God is the only God and the only God that we should worship would be Yahweh, not any feminine deities. So we have these stories of him versus Jezebel, uh, who, is, uh, who marries, who is from a, 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 an Ugaritic or Canaanite nation or something, and she marries one of the kings of, of Israel, which were the Omri, and she brings the Asher deity into the temple uh, and, and makes it, gives it even higher prominence. And so uh, Elijah is all about cleansing Israel from going whoring with the nations and, and having these connections. But they were there all the time anyway. And if you want to read about it, again, Patai gives the whole history of the Hebrew goddess in his book by that title. So after return from the Babylonian exile, monotheism triumphed. It triumphed in... Uh, in Hebrew religion, it triumphed. It was a religion of the prophets, and it triumphed in, uh, in, in really in among the Greek Greek mystery religions and, and Greek religion and philosophy. And Asherah disappeared from the second temple. So in the second temple, you no longer have Asherah, nor do you have the Ark of the Covenant, uh, and you don't have the other ancient Near Eastern winged images like the cherubim in the temple, the second temple that we had, but the first temple of Solomon had all this stuff in it, and it was uh, dedicated to all these deities and, uh, and uh, feminine asherahs were outside. The Hebrew goddess became a part, therefore, of Kabbalistic mysticism and oral legend, which is Haggadah, and uh, it became part of the Jewish mystic tradition because the official tradition of Hasidic Judaism, Pharisaic Judaism, synagogues with rabbis and things where very little was associated with the temple anymore because the temple was in Jerusalem and so most of the worship was done to synagogues, was um, the mysticism of, of the Jewish uh, uh, wisdom schools 
then adapted this over to the idea, the concept of Hachma, or the, the Greek Sophia, wisdom. That's Jewish wisdom, is Hachma. Now, here we have some archaeology speaks much louder than spin, spun details in scripture, so we can find a lot more by just digging up things. This is what an Asherah looked like. It was a terebinth tree. It was also called the Tree of Life. It was an Oats Hainun. And it was carved into a pole, like a yoni, uh, and a lingam, and it was placed next to an altar of Yahweh. And these were all over the place. Uh, it represents the sexual and spiritual union of heaven and earth and the divine androgynous fountain of life and source of being, etc. Some scholars trace the Masonic model for a church steeple, and that was originated by Masons, uh, to this, this shape of the Asherah. In the Bible, Asherah is referred to as a goddess, usually in the form of a sacred terebinth tree. Uh, Hebrew women made an Asherah loaf of bread that was modeled after uh, the image of the Asherah as a kind of primordial communion host. And that is the image that we had of Asherah. Now, what uh, Jillian has done for us is she's made a challah, which is the descendant of all this. The challah on the Shabbat is a descendant of this Asherah bread. And she's given it, fortunately, only two breasts, and that's okay, but she could have given it 15, it would be the same symbol. And uh, we're going to be having that in our Shabbat meal tonight because that was the, the, that was the communion bread. That was on, on the Sabbath, on, on Shabbat. Shabbat was celebrated in uh, way, long, way before the Passover was celebrated. The Passover wasn't really instituted until the time of the Babylonian exile as part of the desire to be free from Babylon. And the idea of being exiles in Egypt was, was booted up and spun around to, to be all the stuff it is today. But at that time, we only have evidence of celebration of Shabbat, the seventh day, the day of rest, of creation. And that day had a lot of Haggadah associated with it. In the Temple of Solomon, the showbread, what was called the showbread, was probably this shape, the shape of the Asherah. It was copied from the Assyrian. You can see a, a, a good article on Wikipedia about this. Now, here we have some pottery with an inscription from a caravan stop in ancient Israel. It says, uh, it's a tree with branches of lotus blossoms, and on each side of the tree is an ibex. And underneath is a lion, and the tree probably represents the Asher, the tree of life. And it shows a cow with her calf, and the male and female standing with cow-like faces, and a seated female playing a lyre. And over their heads is a Hebrew inscription that says, Utterance of Ashwa, and that would be Joash, King Joash of Israel, who flourished from 1802 to 787. The utterance of uh, Ashya, the king, say to Yahalel and to Yahasa and to, and then that part's missing, I bless you by Yahweh of Samaria and his Asherah. So this is, this is you can find other things like this that shows that Yahweh had a consort. He had a Mrs. God. And uh, the picture of the male and female seems to represent Yahweh and his wife. Uh, Hosea condemns what he calls the calf of Samaria. And even the stories later on written about the Exodus, written by the priests a few centuries later, which we, we always think it's earlier because it's about a, supposed to be an earlier time in history, but it's actually not written until much later, makes the sin of the people on the exiles that they worshiped a golden calf. And Moses had to do that. Well, that's the prophetic religion smashing Jezebel right there. But that's not what was really going on back there. This is what was really going on back there. There was a there was a female deity. Yeah. And then you're talking about the two images in the middle. The the calf and the cow. Well, the the two the the images of the two standing people are <coughs> Yahweh and his goddess, his Asherah, his queen. Well, yeah. the two guys standing in one girl city. Uh, well, no, that, that's, that's another person, but the two guys are, the two guys are standing, <coughs> and the two guys are, have phalluses, 
Yeah. But the deities, the female deities, were considered to be male. Mm. Oh. They were androgynous. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> There's like a couple guys in me. Uh, uh, but anyway, the uh, uh, this worship of the of the Ashura is uh, was considered to be foreign by the prophets and the people who were trying to clean up the religion and keep the religion of David, the religion of Moses. But the the settled religion of the Canaanites and of in the in the palaces and the temples and things like that uh, included a female deity. Uh, that of course would be hotly denied by people today because when we read the stories of the Old Testament that are written down maybe five, three centuries later, it's all idealized to make it look like, well, there were people who were whoring around with these other things, but actually that was there to begin with. Um, now, what is this tree of life and what are the mysteries of the Oats Hayim, the tree of life? Well, the Asherah was a cosmic tree and it had seven, it had seven branches and we have here the seven spiked tree of the Assyrian. You can see a picture of that card. That uh, becomes uh, related to the Hebrew seven branched menorah. Now the, the seven branched menorah is only on in the in the, uh, in the in the temple. It's something that's used on the temple on an altar. It's not the same thing as what we do for Hanukkah, which is not seven branched. <laughs> yeah. That this is a seven-branched menorah, and and the seven branches do come from this tree of life, the the, the deity, the female deity's tree of life, the Oats Uh You find it in Druidic and Norse mythology. This tree of life, uh, the roots were the divine sources of all things. The Magna Mater Kubale Sibel, as you may have seen it. Uh, among the Asians and the Asian Minor people and the early Greeks uh, celebrated uh, with a sacred tree that was burned at the winter solstice, a burning winter solstice tree. You might think that that burning tree of Kubelay was a, uh, and this is a picture of Kubelay and Sheridan and her sacred tree. You might think that that is the source of our Christmas tree, but it's not. Um, the Christmas tree and the Yule log are from Odin's sacred oak, oak that's Druidic in its origins. Uh, but this tree thing goes everywhere back in all the ancient religions that have gods and goddesses. And uh, it's interesting that it, even in the Old Testament, in the earliest laws, it is illegal to cut down fruit trees. In fact, you can be executed for doing that. <coughs> now, uh, the uh, a lot of the uh, the the, uh, the Puritans at the time of Shakespeare uh, knew some of this this information. They knew that Easter was actually a development, the Easter eggs and all that was a development of the of the rites around Esther, who was a Druidic goddess. And they knew that the Christmas tree was a development of the rites or from the Druids and and the lights on the tree and so on. So they forbade the celebration of Christmas at the time of. As I've told you before, yeah, at the time of uh, Cromwell, he had criers going around London saying, no Christmas, no Christmas. It was against, against principles to celebrate Christmas because it was a phony pagan holiday to these Christians who were the Puritans. Um, well, it is. So, so what? Let's have Christmas anyway. But uh, uh, <laughs> anyway, the, uh, this, this understanding was something that people did know, they did know that that was, that it's not in the Bible and all this kind of stuff. Christmas trees, what's this? You know? uh, in the seventh century, St. Boniface, his, his, most fa his most famous act was to cut down the sacred oak of the Druids in, uh, in the Celtic lands, and he substitutes what he calls a Christ tree. And so you can probably find an antecedent for a Christmas tree. It's a changed symbol. It's like celebrating St. Valentine's Day instead of Lupercalia. Lupercalia is a wild fest where girls and boys run around and have orgies. And St. Valentine's Day is a day where we celebrate love and compassion and, and this sort of thing. And so that was introduced as a substitute for these old rites. But 
religions grow on the roots of old rites and things, and that's how they, they build their traditions. Now, there are biblical legends of the tree of knowledge and the tree of life, the, the, what you call the Otsayim or the Etsayim, which are written into the book of Genesis by priests of the Babylonian exile when they composed the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis is, it talks about the beginnings of the world and, and you know, uh, the creation of the universe, but it's not, it's not the oldest book of the Bible, it's one of the youngest books of the Bible. The rest are, are very old. And so this is, this is the traditions that were put together by the priests. And it was made of four, four traditions. There were northern traditions. There were those of the Yahwists, the ones who called God Yahweh, the people of Israel. There were the Elohists, who called, they, they called God Elohim. And uh, then there was other special material by the priests and other by the Deuteronomists, the people that wrote Deuteronomy and the traditions that came from that. We call those four sources J, E, P, and D, and they're the sources of <coughs> the, a lot of the Torah, a lot of the five books of the Old Testament that were considered to be the most sacred, from which Talmud Tal Tal was derived, and so on. But in the story that we have in Genesis, uh, there are two trees in the, in the original Garden of Eden. In later Kabbalistic, you'll talk about five trees and other kinds of things about the old Sayyid and so on. But the Otsayim is the, the tree of life. And uh, the Elohim do not want Adam and Eve to partake of the tree of life once they've taken partaken of the tree of knowledge, and they, uh, which means they suddenly know things, they understand things, and uh, if they would take of the tree of life, they would become immortals like them, and so they kick them out of the Garden of Eden. Uh, the old humanity, the old Adam, Adam. Adam is a word that means humanity, and Adam was androgynous. He was he was made, he was both male and female, and he was lonely, and so God divided him. He took part of him and made a woman, and said that that would be a helpmate for him. Well, in the Kabbalistic legends, that was not his first wife. That was his second wife. The first wife that was given to him was created on the sixth day. And we'll talk about her in a little while. So the old humanity was was exiled from the parties from paradise. And it, 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 it supposedly it's for the sin of humans and all this kind of thing, the sin of humanity of not being God and being, allowing yourself to be deceived by your wife, by Eve and all this kind of stuff. Well, we're always you know, thinking that kind of stuff. Uh, and, but the goal of Jewish mysticism in the Kabbalah is the return, the restoration, the tikkun, the return to that primordial unity. And that's still the Jewish, the, the goal of Jewish Kabbalah. And uh, so it's a restoration to pre-Adamic union with God. And, but it can't be, you can't go back. You have to go forward. So how do we restore, how do we, how do we attain the tree of life, and how do we retain, attain the pardes? Now, there's a distinction between a garden and a pardes, a, a garden and a paradise. A garden is something that has an orchard of many different trees, and a pardes is, has an orchard of just uh, uh, one tree. Or sometimes it's turned around, it's given us the other way, or just two trees or something like that. But Kabbalistic uh, stories and Haggadah develop around the idea of the return to paradise. Now, there is a lot of tree mysticism in the teachings of Yeshua. Uh, trees are understood as people. People are trees. Uh, some, of the, some of the things we have about this are the Logian, that, where Yeshua says a good tree is known by its fruits and a bad tree is known by its fruit. He's talking about the moral actions of people. He's comparing that to trees. Uh, there's a parable where a man plants a fig tree and it doesn't bear fruit, but, but uh, he doesn't let the gardener cut it down because he's going to fertilize it and dung it and let it go another year. And that is a, an allegory of mercy upon a human to become, to improve himself uh, instead of just being cut down. And that's another idea of the human being as a tree, a moral tree. Uh, there, when the blind man is healed, he says, I see men as trees walking very strange statement to be made. Uh, <clears throat> trees are related to the parties, to the return to the uh, uh, initial pre-Adamic union with God. 
Um, uh, Yeshua says a, a, a fig tree that is leafing foretells spring, and so signs foretell the advent of the Malkuth, that the tree is a prophetic omen. Uh, you have five trees in paradise, which do not move in summer or in winter, and their leaves do not fall down. Whoever knows them will not taste death. The Gospel of Thomas, this is actually part of a, uh, of a rabbinic and a Talmudic uh, thing. You'll find the five trees in paradise in other Talmudic literature. And this is going to be related to the later Kabbalistic stuff we're going to do. Here there are two trees growing in paradise. One bears fruit, uh, one bears animals, the other bears men. Adam ate from the tree which bore animals. He became an animal and he brought forth animals. But the tree of life is in the middle of the garden. And uh, that's the middle pillar of the garden and so on. This is from the Gospel of Philip. Uh, the Kabbalistic Sephiroth such as Chachma and Malkuth, and so on, is just described in Sefer Yetzirah, which is composed and written at the time of Yeshua, is referred to, these Sephiroths are referred to as part of cosmic realities, and later they're represented as parts of a tree. And they may have been represented that way orally, but we don't know, we don't have the information. In second century Talmudic teaching, uh, it's taught that, quote, every plant and tree has a divine spark within and an angel above encouraging it to grow. And every person has a tree-like spark within him. But the difference between the tree and the man is that the roots of the tree are in the earth and the roots of the man are in heaven. This is, a, this is from the Pardes Institute in Jewish Studies. That, uh, this is a, a current rabbi who is explaining Kabbalistic tree language. The Septuagint translates both the Hebrew gan, garden, and orchard, that, that, that is the garden of Eden, and pardes, paradise, which is a Babylonian word, which usually refers to just a pomegranate, an orchard of pomegranate trees, refers to them both as paradises. So, paradisesos, it should be said, say paradise, paradisos, uh, as a paradise, we get the word paradise, which is a Babylonian word. And that is the name for, another name for the mystical experience of the, of, the, of the Malkuth of God on earth that the mystic has before it's fully realized. So you can mystically participate in the Malkuth and taste the fruits of it, but it isn't fully expressed here yet. Uh, the Talmudic Pardes refers to the mystic veil surrounding the mystic knowledge of God, the mystic gnosis. Medieval written Kabbalah uh, refers to the Sephirotic tree of life that you're probably familiar with. And I like this particular diagram because it shows <coughs> the roots of the tree. It shows the fruits of the tree. Uh, it's rooted in heaven. And these are actually supposed to be leaves. These are the Sephirotic <coughs> These are the names of God. It's a very different kind of diagram than you mar normally see of the Sephirotic tree. Now, how does this relate then to the, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit? Well, we've seen that there's this whole feminine aspect of deity that's, that's always hanging around uh, in ancient Canaanite and Hebrew religion. <coughs> and we'll see later that it's part of the temple trappings and all kinds of things like that. Um, and the... Uh, the mother, the spirit, is seen as a mother, and she's seen as winged because she's a spirit. The spirits are represented as winged, or so angels, and so on. In the exilic and post-exilic priestly tradition, <coughs> Solomon's kingdom fractures into the northern kingdom, which is Israel, known as the Omri. The capital is at Samaria, and the temple is at Beth El. And Judah, which is the southern kingdom with the capital of Jerusalem, the city of David, and the temple at Jerusalem. And Israel is destroyed by the Assyrians, only Judah remains, and the prophetic guilds succeed in reforming Hebrew temple religion to their patriarchal standard. And this is God is banned, and Judaism becomes patriarchal and monotheistic eventually. But Judah's conquered anyway, doesn't help them, they get conquered by the Babylonians, 
in the 6th century, and all Jewish royal and upper class people were taken in captivity to Babylon, the Babylonian captivity, beginning of the Jewish diaspora, the exile, they're exposed to <coughs> Zoroastrian dualism and winged spirit angels and demons. And the book of Genesis is written, the book of Exodus is written, all the traditions are now collected, and, and Israel starts to become a religion of the book. Passover rituals are developed, and eventually the synagogue develops as when they finally do come back in to uh, live in the land where they were coming out of exile. In the fifth century, Ezra and Nehemiah lead pioneers to rebuild the temple, the second temple, and Jerusalem on the condition they won't rebuild the walls so they can't defend it. But of course, they break that right away and build the walls so they can't defend it. Uh, <laughs> um, and the kind of examples at this period of time of the Ruach, the Spirit of God, that we find in the priestly tradition in Genesis are the spirit of the Elohim <coughs> brooding like a hen upon the waters of creation. The divine Ruach is a winged creatrix. She replaces Asherah and Ashtarte and Ishtar and Kodesh. Because what happens is when the Jewish royal families and the educated elite go to Babylon, they want to make a big distinction between the Babylonians and them, but they also assimilate a whole lot of things, like astrology. So you'll find in the written, uh, in the written accounts of creation, it says that God created the stars and the moon and so on to serve as signs and symbols. There's an astrological reason for it and all sort of thing. And, uh, and the spirit of God is feminine and ho hovers over with, with wings over the waters and uh, things are created that way. So that's what happens to Mother God. She's now the spirit of God. Uh, we have some first century survivals in Christian gospel portrayals of the Ruach HaKodesh. Yeshua, for example, is speaking with the Spirit and he says, Oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you under my wings as a hen gathers her chicks and you would not. And this image of Spirit as a bird or as a dove uh, is still a, a, a iconography of the winged uh, female goddess. John sees the Divine Spirit descending upon Yeshua during his baptism in the form of a female dove. The interesting thing, the Peristera is from the Aramaic bird of the goddess Ishtar. <laughs> and the dove represents the mother goddess and the Egyptian Ba, or the immortal soul. So we just can't get rid of mother god. She's just hanging around. And now especially when you have a, a guy like Yeshua who insists upon making that primary. You can sin against God, you can sin against the Son of God, but you better not sin against the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs>
And she, in other words, she was androgynous. She was complete. She was divine. No one would ever question whether she was truly divine. Athena is pictured as enthroned and holding a winged Nike in her right hand uh, on this coin that was minted uh, in very ancient times that you ladies have uh, copies of the image from that were taken on and became part of British coins and things like that. And uh, she was known also as the Kore Cosmo, the Virgin of the World, or the Mother of the World, the Virgin Mother of the World. She's a very important figure. She relates to Isis, and in the Hermetic and Alchemical school, she's a very important figure. The Ruach of God was personified by the Jewish philosophers as Chachma, but was considered to be the very same being, the same figure. And she's the voice of God and the instructress of the wise and the discipliner of fools and the revealer of the divine Ratzi. So that's how you get to God. You can get to God through Chachma, through the, the feminine aspect of deity, because the masculine aspect of God, the male aspect is transcendent and far off, but she is close and she will guide you. She's your guide. <coughs> and Athena, as you might recall, also gave people omens. She was represented as an owl, and you could have various omens of Athena coming and giving you guidance and so on. The Jewish emanation of Godhead known as Chachma was the prototype of the Ruach HaKodesh, of whom Yeshua said, those who deny her or speak ill of her or sin against her have committed an eonic sin and no longer sin. They made a big mistake. They really got it wrong. The wisdom of Jesus ben Sirach, she walks with him, wisdom, she, walks with him, that is the person who seeks wisdom, the, the, uh, <coughs> the seeker and the disciple. Uh, she walks with him as a stranger, just as Yeshua, the risen Christ, met the people on the road to Emmaus as a stranger. And at first she puts him to the test. Fear and dread she brings upon him, and she tries him with her discipline, and with her precepts she puts him to the proof, until his heart is fully with her. Then she returns suddenly to bring him happiness and reveal her Ratsi, her secrets to him. So she is the revealer. She is the Spirit of God. She is what reveals the mysteries of heaven and the mysteries of the uh, Malkuth.
Here are some examples of the wisdom teaching from the wisdom tradition that Yeshua knew quite well. These are from the wisdom of Jesus ben Sira. These were ancient texts that were texts that were transmitted both by Jews and Christians, uh, but they never ended up in either one of their Bible. They ended up in the so-called Apocrypha, the Old Testament Apocrypha, which the Catholic Church still maintains and the Anglican Church maintains, but not as part of the regular scripture. Here's an example of collections of proverbs put into wisdom teaching. My son robbed not the poor man of his livelihood, forced not the eyes of the needy to turn away. A hungry man grieve not, a needy man anger not. Do not exasperate the downtrodden, delay not to give to the needy. So these are wisdom statements about this is the way of God, this is the way of wisdom. A beggar in distress do not reject, avert not your face from the poor. From the needy turn not your eyes, give no man reason to curse you, for if in the bitterness of soul he curse you, his creator will hear his prayer. Now the worst thing you can do is be cursed by someone that you ill-treated who was in need. Uh, Yeshua says, inasmuch as you have not done it to the least of these, my brethren, you have not done it unto me. Endear yourself to the assembly, before a ruler bow your head. Uh, Paul says, uh, be submissive to the rulers, pay your taxes and do things like that, because they wouldn't have their power if God hadn't allowed them to have it, and he has his own mysterious reasons. <clears throat> Wisdom. Give a hearing to the poor man, and return his greeting with courtesy. Deliver the oppressed from the hand of the oppressor. Let not justice be repugnant to you. To the fatherless be as a father, and help their mother as a husband would. Thus you will be like a son to the Most High, and he will be more tender to you than a mother. Notice that here the Father, God, is referred to as a mother. And this is a very important point from, that will come later on. Uh, the Shekinah is another term for the manifestation of the Halakha, the wisdom of God, or the Spirit of God. It's the manifestation and imminence of God. And here from the wisdom of Solomon, he talks about the Shekinah of God. She, again, a female term. Wisdom, Hachma, the creatrix of all, taught me. For in her is a spirit, intelligent, holy, unique, manifold, subtle, agile, clear, unstained, certain, not baneful, loving the good, keen, unhampered, beneficent, kindly, firm, secure, tranquil, all-powerful, all-seeing, and pervading all spirits, though they be intelligent, pure, and very subtle. For wisdom is mobile beyond all motion, and she penetrates and pervades all things by reason of her purity. For she is, is as an aura of the might of God, and the pure effusion of the glory of the Almighty. Therefore, not that is sullied enters into her. For she is the refulgence of eternal light, the spotless mirror of the power of God, the image of his goodness. So this is the mystical concept of the Shekinah, which dwells with righteous people and teaches them and instructs them. And this is the Holy Spirit, even if you read in the Didache of the Twelve Apostles or some of the early Christian writings that are contemporary with the Gospels that didn't make it into the Bible, uh, you will read that the whole, if you make yourself pure and sanctify yourself, the Holy Spirit will dwell in you as she does in a temple. But if you do bad stuff, she will hold her nose and leave you, you know, this sort of thing. Now, the development of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, uh, we have Mrs. God in the post-exilic period. We have a canine tradition of God's feminine aspect of Asherah surviving in the Jewish Haggadah and folk legend as Matronit, the wife of Yahweh. So that's not gone away, but that's just in the Haggadah now. This is uh, part of the Sabbath traditions. The personification of the feminine Shekinah, or imminence or presence or glory of Yahweh in nature, and is perceivable by human senses in things like lightning and sunrise as a moon star, is Matronit. She's the wife of Yahweh. Matronit emerges in the Haggadah as the Shabbat bride of Adonai. When he rests on the seventh day, he pleasures his wife. Now, I was informed about all of this when I was married. <laughs> it's a survival of the Hebrew folk fertility prosperity cult. 
Jewish men have a Shabbat duty to make love with their wife in imitation of and participation in the divine Shabbat lovemaking of Adonai and Matronit. So if you marry a Kabbalistic woman, you've got duties. <laughs> there is a messianic reinterpretation of Yeshua about this. God dwells among the new Israel as a husband dwells with his wife. The Shabbat meal of Yeshua was a messianic wedding banquet and a mystic participation in the coming Malkuth of God on earth. And that was developed in the Christian communion ritual. That's why it was so sacred and so holy. But it was not done on the Sabbath. It was not done on Shabbat. People didn't know anything about the Sabbath, the people who were Gentiles, and they made their day, the holy day, is the, is the first day of the week, which they called the eighth day. And I'll tell you why the eighth is so important when we understand what the eighth heaven is and what the meaning of the eighth day is. The church became understood as the bride of Christ in the Pauline churches and the sacrament of the bride chamber in Gnostic Christianity. And this, of course, all this business about matrimony was not just in order for wives to get their husbands to pleasure them. This was because it was, uh, it was a mystic thing on the level of the Songs of Solomon and the, the high mystic experience of the people on Shabbat. And here's a book you might want to get. This, again, is, is Raphael Tatai, The Hebrew Goddess, and it's a book that you might want to read someday to really understand what the history behind all this is. I've just given kind of a peek of So why do you think that so many people in 21st century fear the idea of the goddess, of God as having a feminine aspect? Why is it that this will get you kicked out of a Lutheran church and out of a Baptist church? And <laughs> All this kind of stuff. Why is it that people are so afraid of this idea? Fear. Hmm? Of what? Quality. Because um. they want control. Control is something that those in control want to hear, isn't it? Yeah. Because they know something very powerful. Yeah. I mean, if your group wants to be in power, then you have to make up that the other group isn't really in power. So when men were able to bully their way into power, the only way they could keep it was to, you know, write the women out of the texts and invent this mythology that women weren't part of. So history is sort of a power struggle of men to dominate women, or? And, you know, you, you mentioned <laughs> circumcision before. That's the ultimate in exclusion. Because that's, you know, the, the, for the covenant for men only. It's, it's the perfect way to exclude women from this invented covenant. Well, if you exclude women, you automatically exclude half the world's population. So that is, as far as excluding, that's a very effective way to do it. But, I mean, throughout human history, it's always been a struggle of one person trying to get over on somebody else, trying to get someone else to do what you want, trying to take what somebody else has. It's, you know, that's the way humans are. In, in the Malkuth, it's not going to be that way. But that's the Malkuth. In the Malkuth, people understand the divine will and way. They voluntarily follow it. They put away those kinds of desires. They're much more inclined to share than they are to steal. But it's, even in ancient times, I think there were people who tried to do that. As you pointed out with the Mycenaeans, they come along and because of their nature of take, destroy, rape, and pillage, the, the followers of the Malkuth, in a way, they're kind of weak because they don't think in those, you know, offensive, defensive terms. They think in constructive, spiritual terms. So their, you know, their, their minds are in a different place. And so if somebody comes along like that, it's easy to destroy them. One of the things I'd recommend you look at in your rooms is the little book by Lama Zopa, which is about a very simple approach to Buddhism. And one of the things he talks about is developing a bodhicitta, which is what we would call the good deeds or the heart. The other thing he talks about is uh, 
the fact that if your first concern is for yourself, your own good, your own pleasure, uh, there's a whole host of problems that comes along with that and you will never get rid of them. And so he talks about developing uh, concern and compassion for others and putting that first instead of your own pleasure, your own advancement, your own this and so. And this, I think, is more what it's about. I don't think it's so much about men versus women as it is the, the, the egoistic concerns of humanity. There are women just as much as men that do this and do it in their own way. And women are some of the most famous poisoners in the world. And, you know, they have their ways of getting their power. <coughs> but uh, I think it has to do with a much more cosmic thing. It has to do with uh, this. And you might notice that all the prayers of Yeshua are, are phrased and he tells you to pray, we, not I, and, uh, and, uh, and us, not me, and so on. That, that's part of the halakha we're going to be looking at. So let's take a little break now, uh, but let's try to break it only about 15 or 20 minutes so we can get back. I, I want to get you the stuff about the shakad before we actually do it tonight. You're behind.